This evening we're going to be <clears throat> looking at that uh, portion of Luke's gospel that I made just reference to this morning as, again, one of the examples of how we respond to God's grace. And here we see, a, a, I think, another contrast. Remember this morning we saw how there were ten lepers who cried out to the Lord for mercy, and the Lord showed mercy to all ten, but only one of them actually turned back to uh, thank God and to worship the Lord Jesus. Here we see another contrast that's similar to that, where Jesus is invited over to a Pharisee's house for a meal. And while he's there, a woman comes, and you're familiar with the um, story how she's weeping because of her joy and, and the Lord's mercy in her life, anointing, washing his feet, anointing his feet, and uh, just kissing his feet and worshiping the Lord and thanking him for his mercy while the, the Pharisee sits there and despises the woman and despises the Lord, okay? Again, one who receives this grace and worships the Lord, the other who doesn't and despises him. Uh, what we're looking at, of course, is that worship is the response of grace, but we also this evening want to look at uh, what, what that means. What is worship? How do we worship the Lord? Uh, what do we see in, in these examples? So let's begin by looking at this particular uh, account in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, and I'd like to read verses 36 through 50. Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume, and standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. And he replied, say it, teacher. A moneylender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Then he said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those who were reclining at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Well, may the Lord again bless his word uh, to our hearing this evening. We're going to look at this account mainly under the last point uh, of the sermon. But just as a reminder of what we saw this morning and I've already told you as we've been working our way towards this particular text, the right response to God's grace is worship. Uh, so many every day receive the good things that the Lord uh, has to give, but there's really only a very few that take time to thank Him, that take time to worship Him for those gifts. Again, Jesus healed the ten lepers, but only one returned to praise Him. And we saw that there are really few who worship him. Uh, there was only one because really only few have really had their hearts changed by the grace of God. Remember, there's the faith of miracles. There's people who believe, who believe the truth, but whose hearts are really not changed by that truth so that they don't really love the Lord. If our hearts have been changed, and this is really the point we saw this morning, if our hearts have been changed, if we have been cleansed, of the spiritual leprosy which was ours, which we came into the world with by God's grace, uh, 
we will worship him. But I think there's at least uh, three more questions that we need to ask uh, with regard to this topic. Uh, the first one is, what does it mean to worship the Lord? Uh, what was this leper doing? What, you know, or these other examples we had in Scripture, what were they doing that constituted worship? What does that look like? Uh, secondly, how should we worship Him Today, how can we apply the principles we see in Scripture to our experience today? And then thirdly, why do we often struggle to do this? Not so much to apply the principle, but rather to, to worship the Lord. Uh, why don't we worship Him more than we do? And I think if we're all honest with our own experience, we would say it is a struggle, at least sometimes, if not often, to worship the Lord. So let's consider each of these for just a few moments this evening. Now, first of all, what does it mean to worship the Lord? What are we talking about? Well, in, in the Bible, there are many words that are used to refer to worship, but there are two main words that are used in the New Testament. The first word essentially means to bow down, to kiss the feet or the hem of someone's garment to lie face down on the ground, prostrate in admiration and adoration. And you know, we've actually seen that already in several of these examples. Essentially what it means is to have the right kind of posture in our worship. Now let's look at a few more examples. This is what the wise men intended to do, remember, when they came to Jerusalem and they were searching out the newborn king. They wanted to find him so that they might worship him. We see in uh, Matthew 2, verses 1 and 2, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now this is the word that is used here to bow down to prostrate ourselves before him and to worship him. And when they found the child, that's exactly what they did. We read in Matthew 2, verse 11. After coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and, and myrrh. You know, I think we, we often uh, read these examples and perhaps miss the fact that this is actually taking place. This is what they're doing. They're, they're getting on their faces before the Lord and worshiping Him. Now, we read about the ten lepers this morning, and we saw that the one came back and bowed down uh, before the feet of Jesus and worshiped Him. But there was another leper who did the same thing as he was approaching Jesus, asking for His mercy. We read in Matthew 8, verse 2, And a leper came to Him and bowed down before Him. And said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Again, we see this posture of bowing, this posture of kneeling before the Lord. This is what the disciples did when Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. I don't know how many times I read that account and, and missed this particular point in Matthew 28, verse 9. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them, and they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Well, that, that means that they had to get down pretty low if they're going to take hold of Jesus' feet. So they prostrated themselves before Jesus and they worshipped him. You know, this is something also that the demon-possessed man by the name of Legion did when he saw Jesus. We read in Mark 5, verses 6 and 7. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High? I implore you by God, do not torment me. Now, this was actually a form of worship, but this is not worship out of love, obviously. This is worship out of fear. Do not torment me, Jesus, before the time. Now, we see people falling down before Jesus when he's a baby. We see him, them falling down before Jesus in his ministry. We see the demons falling down before Jesus. And, you know, can there really be any question that Jesus was worshipped and that he should continue to be worshipped? Again, I would 
just encourage you to bring that point up to any Jehovah's Witness that might challenge you on that point because only God is to be worshipped and we're going to see that in the next example. Do you realize that this is what the devil was asking Jesus to do when he tempted him in the wilderness with the promise of the kingdoms of the world? We read in Matthew 4 verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory and he said to him, all these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. In other words, prostrate yourself before me, kiss my feet, Jesus, and I will give you these things. And we know how Jesus responded to this. He says in verse 10, go, Satan. And I think literally it essentially means this, get away from me, Satan. Why? For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now this is the passage again. Remember that only God is to be worshipped. We are only to fall down before him and worship him. And yet, how many fell down before Jesus and worshipped him? And of course that's because he is God in our nature. So the first word essentially means to prostrate ourselves, to fall down, to bow down, to look down, kneel down before the Lord in our posture of worship. Now, the second word has to do with the way in which we worship the Lord. It means essentially to serve or to carry out religious duties or rites, depending upon what it is that the Lord is calling us to do, of course, in the right spirit, in the spirit of worship. And essentially, it means to worship in the, the right way. Now, remember when Jesus responded to the devil in our previous verse, he actually used both words to make it absolutely clear that this kind of worship was to be given to God alone. Notice he said in Matthew 4.10, you shall worship, that is you shall fall down or adore the Lord your God and serve, that is carry out your religious service to him only. Only God is to be worshiped, only God is to be served. Now this is what we again, what we see the people of God doing in Scripture. Remember the, uh, the prophetess Anna, who gave her life to worship the Lord. We read in Luke 2, verses 36 to 37, and there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple serving night and day with fastings and prayers. Essentially, she was devoting her life to the worship of the Lord. When the Lord delivered Israel out of Egypt, this is why he delivered them. This is what he expected of them for that redemption of their lives out of Egypt. Stephen, when he was speaking before the Sanhedrin in Acts 7, verses 6 through 7, said this, But God spoke to this effect, that his descendants would be aliens in a foreign land, Abraham's, and that they would be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. And whatever nation to which they will be in bondage, I myself will judge, said God, and after that they will come out and serve me in this place. The reason why God redeems is that his people might serve, and that is worship. This is what Paul did when the Lord called him. In 2 Timothy 1.3, he writes to Timothy, I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did. And this is what Paul says that we will do if our hearts have been circumcised by the same spirit that circumcised his heart. Philippians 3, verse 3. For we are the true circumcision, who worship in the spirit of God. And in this case, this is the second word, who serve in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So essentially, what is worship? Worship is having the right posture, which is uh, bowing down and submitting to the Lord, adoring Him. Uh, and it's having, of course, the right way of, worship him, of worshiping Him, which is the service that the Lord calls us uh, to give Him. Now, the question we might ask is, what should that look like in our lives today? Particularly the first one, because when's the last time you actually got on your face before the Lord 
or kiss the feet of Jesus. Now, this is something obviously that there's going to be somewhat of a change because Jesus is not here on earth today. Uh, so we can't do what the disciples did uh, to him. And we need to make sure, because of what the Lord calls us to do in Scripture, not to show this kind of love and devotion and worship to something uh, that sort of resembles him or is meant to represent him, such as an image. You know, the Roman Catholic Church does this, don't they? When they, they bow down and they kiss the feet of statues that they've made of Jesus and of Mary and of the saints. Sometimes they've been kissed so many times that the, the toes are beginning to lose their definition. You know, it, it, they're, they're wearing out. And we know the Eastern Orthodox Church does essentially the same thing only with two-dimensional images that they call icons. But the Lord tells us quite clearly in his word that that isn't what he wants us to do in our worship of him. We are not to worship images. We are not to bow down and kiss things that are meant to represent the Lord Jesus. In Exodus 20, verses 4 through 5, he says, You shall not make for yourself an idol. Or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth, you shall not worship them or serve them, by which the Lord means not just that we're not to make you know, uh, images of creatures like the, the golden calf and worship God as, as a creature. But the Lord made it quite clear in the Old Testament that um, he never appeared in a form that they could recreate and worship, because that is not what he wanted them to do. He wanted them to worship him in spirit and in truth. But now, the fact that we can't bow down and, and worship Jesus in this way doesn't mean that there aren't ways in which we can worship the Lord with the right posture. And there, there's a variety of postures in Scripture, to be sure, but this one is one of them. And this is one of the reasons why when we worship the Lord... Sometimes when we pray, especially when we pray, that we bow our heads in worship because we're essentially showing him respect. We're showing him honor. We're showing our submission to him and our utter dependence upon him. And that is an act of worship. We're showing him our love. We're showing him our admiration. We're showing him our adoration. Now, historically, some of the Protestant churches have what they call kneeling benches, to kneel when they worship the Lord in prayer. And, and they use the, the kneeling bench because it gets kind of hard to be on your knees for a long period of time. And maybe for some people, it's very difficult. Now, in uh, other churches that perhaps are a little bit less um, inhibited than, than perhaps we are, uh, being uh, you know, an Orthodox Presbyterian church back in the days of Calvary Chapel, uh, one of the things that, that we did in, in leadership was that we would regularly get on our knees when we would pray. Or sometimes we would lay on the ground, prostrate before the Lord, and seek for His grace and His mercy and His blessings upon the service. Or maybe at lunchtime we would get together and again get on our faces before the Lord because we saw in Scripture that that is what the people of God did in order to worship the Lord. Maybe this is something that you've done in your own private worship and prayer time and maybe it's something that you felt like you really needed to do when you were earnestly seeking the Lord for some mercy in your life. Just getting on the ground before the Lord and pleading uh, with Him. It shows, again, humility uh, to do that. It shows dependence. It shows that He's our only hope when we, as it were, abandon everything and just lie before Him. Again, a posture that we see often in Scripture, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's not the only posture for, posture for worship, but it is clearly one that is held out to us as an example of what we are to do. I don't know that we have any examples of that in, in public worship as far as the people of God gathering, but we certainly do have it done publicly in, in the numerous examples that I just gave you from Scripture. Now, with regard to the right way to worship, this is something we're more familiar with. You know, the service that we render to the Lord, this is what we usually think about as worship. When we gather together and lift up our voices to the Lord, as we just did a few moments ago, expressing our love to Him, expressing our thanksgiving to the Lord for all of His mercies, 
when we confess our sins before him, when we ask him for his mercies and trust him, you know, putting your faith in somebody to meet your needs, particularly the Lord, is an act of worship. We are to really swear by his name only. We are to trust him only. We are to have faith in him only. He is the one we are to look to for our particular needs and not to any man. So we are to ask him and trust him to give us the things that he has promised according to his word. That's an act of worship. We are to read his word. We are to hear the word explained. We are to hear the word applied. That's an act of worship. We are to remember the Father's love and sending his Son for us to die for us on the cross and the Son's love for giving up his life for us as we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And of course, having fellowship with him is an act of worship, being spiritually fed by him, by his Holy Spirit through all of these things. That is the right way of worship. That is why we gather together for worship and to have fellowship with each other. To serve and to be served by one another as members of his body as we minister the gifts that the Lord has given to us to one another to build one another up and encourage one another. These are the things the Lord calls us to do as acts of worship to him and why the Lord calls us to meet together and not to forsake this meeting or to neglect this time because we need it. We need this. I think I may have mentioned this morning, or at least I was reminded in prayer time that I mentioned it this morning, that God calls us to worship him not because he needs our worship. It is the right thing that we do worship him for who he is and what he's done, but he doesn't need our worship. He is independent. He doesn't need anything. He doesn't depend on us. He didn't need to create. He didn't need to have us worship him. But he commands us to worship him because it's right, and he commands us to worship him because we need to worship him. This worship is for our benefit more than for, for his. Again, he doesn't benefit from it. We do. Now, there is a sense in which our Lord Jesus in his humanity benefits from it, as Jonathan Edwards pointed out. But as God, he doesn't need our worship. He is a full bucket. We are the empty ones. We're the ones who need to be filled. And he fills us as we worship him. So that is the right manner of worship as we meet together for worship. But let's not forget there's also a broader kind of worship that the Lord calls us to offer to him, the kind that the Apostle Paul was speaking about when he says, I serve the Lord with a clear conscience. He wasn't talking just about meeting together for worship and serving the Lord in the worship service. He was talking about his life. The Lord calls us to offer our lives to him as living sacrifices. That is worship. He writes in Romans 12, verse 1, again, very, very familiar passage. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And here again, that word service is being used. Now, we are to offer our lives to the Lord to worship Him in, in both of these senses. Because of who He is, He's God. He's perfect. He's beautiful. He's holy. He's gracious. He's loving. He's just. God is perfection itself, and we should worship Him for those reasons, but we should also worship Him because of all that He has done for us. Remember, the right response to the grace of God is worship. And that's what we see again and again in Scripture, how those who received his grace worshipped him. And in our worship, we are to give ourselves to him completely, to live as he calls us to live, a life of holiness set apart to him, a life of loving service to him and to our neighbor, really to live as Jesus lived. He is the perfect example of how to worship God. We are to become like him. That's why we're predestined to become like Jesus. That happens in this life, not just in the life to come. It is why he gave us the Holy Spirit to work this in us. It's why we're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision in our lives for the desires of the flesh. It is that we might worship God the way that Jesus worshiped God according to his word. This is the kind of worship that pleases him. So again, the right 
posture in our worship, that of submission and adoration, the right uh, way, the right manner of worshiping him according to his word in the public service and in our lives. But finally, we need to ask the question, why do we struggle to do this? Why do we find ourselves not worshiping the Lord more than we do? I, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm, I'm sure that all of us have asked that question at one time or another because how many of us really measure up to the example we have in the Lord Jesus? But don't we want to do that? You see, our worship is not measuring up. It's not what we want it to be. Why do we struggle in this area? Well, it's because I think, among other things, what Jesus is talking about in our passage in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, he says, when he's explaining this to Simon, for this reason I say to you, her sins which are many have been forgiven, for she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. Why don't we worship the Lord more than we do? It's because I think we have forgotten how indebted we are to him and how much we ought to love him for the mercies that he has shown to us. We need to have the right perspective. We need to remember all these things that the Lord has done. And we need to remember who he is, that our hearts might be filled with love. We need to have the right kind of heart before the Lord. That's the limiting factor in, in most of our situations. Remember, if you have the right kind of heart, if you desire something strongly enough, it, it really gives you the power to overcome everything that stands in the way and to push through and to really obtain what it is you really desire. When the affections of your heart are strong enough, we need that kind of heart. Well, that's the kind of heart that this woman had. This woman had experienced God's mercy and grace through the Lord Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of her sins. She knew that God had received her. And so she was sh showering Jesus with her love and devotion. Now, she didn't earn his forgiveness by her show of, a, of affection. It was the evidence that she had received the mercy of the Lord. So what do we see in this woman? Well, notice, first of all, in our text, I'm not going to read it again, but let me just point out a few things. She came to Simon's house with a very expensive perfume, apparently very expensive. I think this is the, the one that Judas had pointed out, that this perfume could have been sold for this rather large sum and the money given to the poor. It was very expensive. But she came to Simon's house because she heard Jesus was there and she was intending to use it on Jesus. Now, she stood behind him at his feet, which sounded kind of strange, so I had to look into what does that mean? You stand behind somebody at their feet. Well, it really had to do with the way people were situated when they were having a meal together in this particular culture because they wouldn't just sit in a chair with their feet forward, but they would recline on couches with their feet actually pointing backwards. And the servants would stand behind them, essentially waiting to, to serve them in some way. And that's essentially what this woman did. She stood behind him at his feet. So his feet would be pointing backwards. She'd be standing behind him, looking at his feet. And of course, while she stood there, she was so overcome with the grace and the mercy of the Lord that she began to weep and she couldn't stop weeping and her tears began to fall on his feet. And so she knelt down and wiped the tears from his feet with her hair and was kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. Remember what worship is. They, the, the disciples fell down before Jesus and took hold of his feet. Here she's washing his feet and she's anointing his feet and she's kissing his feet. This is worship. You know, like the leper that we saw this morning, who shouted out to you know, publicly praise God for this mercy that he's shown me, she was doing this essentially publicly. I mean, there, there were apparently several in this house. Even knowing whose house it was that she was at and what basically the host would think about her. Remember, Simon was a Pharisee and this woman was a sinner, which means that she was a harlot. He despised this woman and what she was doing to Jesus, and he despised Jesus as well. Now, Jesus knew what he was thinking about her, and so he defended her. And he said to Simon, where he had failed, 
to offer him the customary foot washing, to give him the kiss of greeting, and to anoint his head with oil, which would have been a part of the, again, the ordinary parts of Jewish hospitality. This is what you would do when you receive somebody into your house. It seems foreign to us, but this is how they would minister to that person. He failed to do any of these things because of his heart, but she had done all three. Now, why did she do this? Why did she worship Jesus like this while Simon did not worship Jesus? Well, Jesus tells us it was because of what she had experienced of God's grace and how much both of them loved or didn't love him. The one who has been forgiven much loves much. The one forgiven little loves little. Now, you know, when Jesus said this, it's, he may not necessarily be saying that the woman was necessarily any guiltier than Simon was guilty. In God's scale of justice, they, they may not have been that far apart. I mean, she was a harlot and Simon a self-righteous Pharisee. Now, Simon might have actually been worse because he knew more about what God wanted. He was an expert in the law. And he didn't do what it is the Lord called him to do. Remember on that one occasion when Jesus said, Woe to you, Capernaum, because if the miracles had occurred in you, or occurred in, in Sodom and Gomorrah that occurred in you, they would have repented. Uh, it, nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for you. It's quite likely that Simon was actually guiltier before the Lord than the woman was. But I think Jesus' point is this, the woman knew how great her sins were in God's eyes and also how great God's mercy was on that account for forgiving her. While well, Simon, the self-righteous Pharisee, thought he was doing just fine without God's grace. He didn't see the depths of his sin. The one who's forgiven much loves much. The one who's forgiven little loves little. Simon didn't think he had much to be forgiven of, so he didn't have much affection towards the Lord. But the woman knew the greatness of her sins and that they were forgiven. And so she loves much. So why do we sometimes struggle to worship the Lord? Well, maybe we have forgotten, you know, what we were. Maybe we've forgotten what the Lord has done for us. Maybe we've grown used to the grace of our Lord. Maybe we need to remember the pit from which we were dug. We need to remember where it was we were headed when we came into the world and where it is we're now going by the grace of God. Uh, we need to rekindle not only our love of thankfulness by considering what the Lord has done for us, but we also need to get a clearer sight of God's beauty through His Holy Spirit, by being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the only way to do that. So that our hearts will move us to give ourselves to worship and to serve the Lord in the way that answers to His grace. So again, when we ask the question, what is worship? Well, worship is having the right posture, right? It's bowing before the Lord and it's submitting to Him in order to worship Him. But it's also serving Him in the right way, worshiping Him in the way He wants to be worshipped. That's one thing we seem to miss today because people want to worship God in their own way, but God tells us in His Word how He wants us to worship Him. I think it's, it behooves us as servants to do it the way the Lord calls us to do it if we want to please Him. And that's what He tells us in His Word. But that applies again to all of life. So having the right posture, worshiping Him in the right way, and of course having the right kind of heart, which we will only have if we see His glory and if we remember what the Lord has done for us. So may the Lord give us the grace to be able to worship Him in the way he calls us to worship him. Being those who have received the grace of God, we will want to do uh, exactly that. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to give us his grace to do so.